Billington House um, courtyard. So if you're at the front, please go through the doors here. If you're at the back, please go through those doors at the rear. Um, before we begin, there's a date for your diary, which is the 23rd of November, which then we'll be having the Glossop Medal and Award evening. Should be a very good evening with um, John Harrison speaking. Um, but before we begin, I, we're just going to, um, the new charge officer at the Geological Society is just going to, um, Eleanor Williams is just going to give a few words. So I'll just hand it over now. Hi there. Um, I just thought I'd introduce myself, basically. I started at the Geological Society three months ago. Um, we've taken over from Sean Richardson, who'd been here for three years. Um, so I am now in place on a full-time basis. Um, so although I'm working remotely, I do pop down to Burlington House. And as I happen to be here today, I thought I would use the opportunity just to um, allow people to put a face to a name. Um, and yeah, just to encourage anyone who's interested in applying for chartership or who's already chartered and would like to become a scrutineer to, um, you know, just to get in touch. Um, we are we're in the process of looking to update the web page at the moment. Um, and make it a bit more zazzy and exciting. Um, but if you've got questions, just come and give us a shout. I'm happy to have chats on Teams or Zoom. Um, if you would rather chat in person than and sort of troll through guidance and things like that. But yeah, that was it really, just a face to a name and introduce myself. Enjoy the rest of your talk. Thank you, Eleanor. So this evening we're joined by Professor John Cosgrove of Imperial College London. John is Professor of Structural Geology at Imperial and has authored numerous books and academic papers in structural geology. Um, he's known internationally for applying his expertise in advising on complex rock engineering projects internationally. And this evening, John will be talking about geological evolution of fracture networks and the impact for bulk properties of rock masses. So please keep any questions to the end. And if you can keep your phones on silence, that'd be great. For colleagues who are joining online, if you can put your um, questions in the Zoom chat, and I shall read them out towards the end. So now, without further ado, passing on to John. Thank you, Tom. Um, I must say I was delighted when I was invited as a structural geologist to talk to engineering geologists or geologists. I don't know how you describe yourself. I know what rock mechanics people are. I know engineering geology, I know rock engineering, but people who are involved in this aspect of, um, of earth sciences. There's been a link between our two subjects for many years, and it was championed by people like John Hudson, who was a um, professor of rock engineering at Imperial College for many years, when John Harrison and myself were young lecturers. And the link between our two subjects is pretty clear. We're both interested in the geometry, the generation and the properties of fractured rock masses. And we want to know a little bit more about the fracture networks which populate these uh, rock masses and which give them their properties. Both groups of scientists agree that the fractured rock mass, its bulk properties are generally controlled by the fracture network. And the structural geologist feels that he has an insight into the generation of these networks, which might be of use to the engineering geologist. For example, if you think about the generation of a fractured rock mass, then the structural geologist is interested in how it was generated, the process that, by which that fracture network was generated. Coming from the other side, the rock engineer is more interested in the properties that, fractured, that fracture network gives to the rock mass. And I feel that if we can tell engineering geologists a little bit about how we understand the process of evolution of these networks, we think of them as being generated by the superposition over geological time of individual fracture sets. That reveals some interesting details about the fracture geometry of the networks, which I think will be of real interest to the rock engineer. So let's, without any more ado, get on to this. I'm doing my best to advance the slide, but nothing's happening. Can you help? Nothing happening. Thanks. <coughs> That's more interesting, I think. 
Just give them a few minutes to get this show on the road. Wonderful. Thank you. <clears throat> so the lecture outline, I'm going to consider what controls the geometry of fracture sets. Remember, fracture networks in a rock are usually generated by the superposition of several fracture sets. So let's start off going right back to an individual fracture set, which is generated by one particular stress field. Okay. And then after having considered that, we'll then look at what happens when we superimpose fracture sets and get a fracture network. And then finally, we'll attempt to apply the insights and ideas we've generated from those two studies to a field study which determines the geometry of the fracture network in a specific fracture rock mass. And the rock mass I'm going to consider with you briefly at the end of the lecture is the intensely fractured uh, Cadomium granites, the Precambrian granites that characterize the coast of Jersey and the Channel Islands. And you can see a couple of examples here. So we've got these fractured rock masses and the challenge is to understand in detail what the fracture network is within this rock mass so that we can understand its bulk ge geomechanical properties. Now, <clears throat> the links between our two subjects are clear. And it's because both groups of earth scientists use the same mechanical principles to resolve the problems. But the, the differences are the boundary conditions under which they consider this process. So the structural geologist is looking at rock deformation, that is the response of a rock mass to, to stress, under conditions of high pressure, high temperature, long time intervals, and slow strain rates. In contrast, the rock engineer considers deformation under conditions of low temperature, low pressure, over relatively short intervals, a hundred or tens of years, hundreds of years, and at fast strain rates. And our interests are different as well, in that the structural geologist is interested in determining how the fracture networks in the rock develop and what it can tell us about the evolution of the regional stress regimes through geological time. That's what we want to know, how the rock mass deformed in the past and how the fracture network was generated. In contrast, the engineer is interested in the impact of the fracture network within the rock mass on the likely future deformation of history. In other words, how will the, uh, the rock mass respond when we impose new boundary conditions of loading or excavation upon it? <clears throat> So the major channel challenge for many uh, rock engineers is to work out what the geomechanical properties of fractured rock masses are. And we know these depend on the intrinsic properties of the rock, but perhaps more importantly, on the geometry of the fracture network. Because it's these fractures that control the bulk mechanical properties. Now we can show that an understanding of structural geology of the study area and of its tectonic evolution can be used to start to quantify what these parameters are. And they enable us to guide people, inform the siting and orientation of engineering structures, and also any numerical models that are being done. So what controls the geometry of a fracture set right from the beginning of fracture set, a single fracture set? Well, we have to drift back to our first year lectures on, on, on <coughs> a brittle failure. And we can see that when we look at that summary diagram that summarizes brittle failure, we understand immediately the relationship between, sorry, the relationship between fracture orientation and the stress generating those fractures. We also understand the link between the type of fracture, that is shear fracture or extensional fracture, and the differential stress sigma one minus sigma three. Let's quickly revise this little diagram. It helps a lot. You can see it's basically a plot of the failure criteria for shear indicated by this inclined line here and the failure criteria for extensional failure indicated by this parabolic portion of the curve here. You can see that two stress fields have been put onto this diagram, two more circles representing the stress fields. The first one, the large circle, is a stress field with a relatively large differential stress. Here's sigma one and here's sigma three. And this circle touches the shear failure envelope and therefore will generate shear failure. In contrast, this stress state here with a low differential stress, a small diameter, is able to contact the extensional failure criteria and give rise to extensional failure. So that's, that's the basic summary of brittle failure. Shear failure, extensional failure, the formation of shear fracture requires a relatively large differential stress, a large Mohr circle, 
and the formation of extensional fractures, a relatively small circle. The actual magnitude of the circle that marks the transition from a stress field that will generate shear failure to one that will generate extensional failure is when the diameter of the stress circle is about four times the tensile strength of the rock. So what's beautiful about this diagram is you can see that there's a wonderful relation, simple relationship between the orientation of the fractures that form and the stress fields that generate them. Extensional fractures form at right angles to the least principal compression sigma three, and shear fractures form symmetrically about the maximum principal crush compression sigma one. So if you were to show me a fracture in the field, I could clip onto it the causative stress field. Similarly, if you show me a stress field, I can predict the orientation of the fractures that will form. And if I know enough about the stress field, whether it will be shear failure or extensional failure. So that's the basic summary I wanted to, to go through. You, we, we'll draw on this as the lecture goes through, just to remind you. And you can see really decent examples in the lower photographs of first of conjugate normal faults, which correspond to this diagram here. There must have been a relatively high differential stress when these structures were forming. They're formed in the Carboniferous turbidites of Southwest England. And in contrast, you can see several sets of extensional fractures formed in the Liasic limestone beds on the coast of the Bristol Channel. So these are the two fundamental types of fractures that develop in rock. This is what determines how they form, why they form, what the conditions are, and what their orientations are with respect to the causative stress field. So having got that under our belt, we can move on and argue that, well, if fractures are related to the stress that generate them, and we want to know what the fractures are in the crust, what we need to know is, of course, what the stress field is in the crust. So that's the first thing we have to do. So what is the condition of stress that's likely to occur in the upper part of the crust? Well, there are two processes of uh, stressing, two important processes of stressing in, in nature. One is the gravitational loading caused by the overburden, and the other is the possibility of horizontal, large horizontal stresses generated by plate motion. And for simplicity's sake, I'm going to just consider the effect of an overburden stress. One can always add in the effect of a, a tectonic stress afterwards if necessary. And this is particularly easy to understand. We've got a load, uh, we've got a surface here, we come down in depth, the, the, the stress increases, and we can simply use Newton's equation that force is mass times acceleration to find out what the vertical stress is at any particular depth, Z. So that's simply, Force is mass times acceleration. Stress is force per unit area, which is Z times one times one, which is the, uh, the, the volume times the density, which is the mass. And then the mass times the acceleration gives you the force per unit area, which is the stress. So we've got a vertical stress given by Z rho G. And you can see if we plot this and assume that the density doesn't change with depth, we get a nice straight line relationship showing that increase in the vertical stress with depth. Now, although we're not applying a horizontal stress, it doesn't mean there isn't a horizontal stress in the rock. What actually happens is the overburdened stress tries to cause the rocks beneath it to expand laterally. I mean, you know, if you load a rock and deform it axially, you'll get a, a lateral expansion and the lateral expansion uh, compared to the axial shortening is Poisson's ratio. And that gives you a measure of the compressibility of a rock. And so, if the rock will not expand laterally because of the confining effect of the surrounding rock, the surrounding rock has to apply a stress of this magnitude to prevent that expansion. So this is, this, you can see very obviously that horizontal stress will relate to the vertical stress and also to Poisson's ratio, M is the reciprocal of Poisson's ratio, Poisson's number. So a nice simple relationship between the vertical and horizontal stress through the compressibility of the rock. And you can see again, if we assume that Poisson's number remains constant with depth, we get a nice linear relationship as we go in depth and increase in sigma three. What's also apparent from this diagram, you can see that the two curves diverge with depth and therefore as we go deeper and deeper into the earth's crust so the differential stress sigma one minus sigma three increases and i mentioned briefly to you at the, when we were looking at brittle failure that the boundary between extensional failure 
and shear failure occurs when the differential stress, that is the size, the diameter of the Mohr circle, is about four times the tensile strength of the rock. So we're going to have an upper zone of extensional failure, which will produce vertical extensional fractures in the crust. And at some particular depth, when the differential stress exceeds that magnitude, we'll start to get shear failure. Very, very simple. Now, of course, it's extremely naive, and there are many other parameters we ought to take into account to get a, a better handle on what the magnitude of these stresses are. There are other parameters that influence what that stress is, and an important one is the temperature, because uh, as, you, as you all know, there's a, a geothermal gradient, an increase in temperature with depth, and of course, as the rock heats up, it's going to expand. But again, for the same reason uh, we argued about the potential expansion due to the overburden load, the surrounding rock does not allow that expansion to occur. It has to apply another stress to inhibit that. And here we've got it. So the <clears throat> amount of expansion is a function of the coefficient of thermal uh, expansion. And the actual uh, uh, value of the expansion is simply that value multiplied by the change in temperature from the surface to the depth of interest. And that gives you the expansion, the strain. And we can therefore change that strain to a stress using simply uh, stress is Young's modulus time strain, Hooke's law. And we simply plug in for E alpha delta T, and you can see the stress generated by that thermal expansion would be equal to E alpha delta T. So in other words, the surrounding rock has to apply that stress element as well to prevent that thermal expansion occurring. So we can add this stress term into the horizontal stresses X and Y, and here they are. So then I won't go on, there are many other parameters we can add in, but the interesting thing that comes out from these equations is that the stress condition is not just a function of the depth in the crust, and the density of the overburden. You can see that the actual magnitude of the horizontal stresses involves a, a variety of intrinsic properties of the rock, including uh, Poisson's number, the reciprocal of Poisson's ratio, Young's modulus, and the coefficient of thermal expansion. Now, what are the implications of those equations? What does it really tell us? Well, I think it's quite interesting. What you can see is that <clears throat> the state of stress in adjacent layers at any particular depth, let's say we take a depth down here and we've got three or four layers next to each other, uh, the state of stress can be very different. Admittedly, if you're say two kilometers down and you've got four beds um, next to each other, a meter thick, they've effectively all got the same overburden. They've all got sigma one as their overburden is the same value. But clearly, because of the dependence of the horizontal stress on these various intrinsic properties of the rock, we're going to get different horizontal stresses in the different rocks. So this is the first thing we managed to get this idea that we're going to get different states of stress in the different layers, even though we're just applying a single overburden stress. Now, interestingly, you can see from this diagram both the increase in vertical and the increase in horizontal stress occurs in the compressive region of the, of the graph. This is the extensional region on this side. And so both sigma one and sigma three are compressive and they all lie well inside the failure envelope. And might, one might argue therefore that they're not gonna be, that, that they're, they're potentially gonna cause failure, but they're nowhere near the failure envelope. And therefore we're not gonna get these fractures developing. But of course we know from our experience when we look at at rocks around the world, we see the upper uh, level in the crust is absolutely stuffed full of fractures, often extensional fractures. And it's argued sometimes these are a consequence of exhumation, and that may be the case. But we can also generate them during burial uh, in response to the stress field we've just been talking about, if of course we appeal to a high fluid pressure. And we know beneath the, the, um, the, the water table, the, the rocks are saturated and with con, con, uh, continued burial, we can get overpressuring. So there's no possibility about, and there's no probability, sorry, excuse me, there is no difficulty in getting a high fluid pressure generated. And so we can just go to our little diagram that explains exactly what effect that fluid pressure has on the stress state. Here's your fluid pressure represented by a circle, of course. Here's a strain ellipse, sorry, the stress ellipse representing the 
lithostatic stress, the vertical sigma V, sigma one, and the horizontal sigma three, we add to that compressive stress, the extensional uh, pressure represented by this circle. And of course, stress is an additive. You can't have two separate stress fields operating at the same time in the field they add together. And you can see the effect is to reduce every normal stress in all directions by an amount P. Sigma one becomes sigma one minus P and sigma three becomes sigma three minus P. Now, what that does, of course, to the stress circle, the lithostatic stress, here's the lithostatic stress, sigma one and sigma three. We, inc we, we reduce sigma one and sigma three by P, the whole circle moves bodily to the left-hand side. And if P is of sufficient magnitude, clearly it will cause that stress field to impact with the failure envelope and cause hydraulic fracturing. And of course, depending on the size of that circle, it can produce shear failure as it would do in this case, or if the circle was smaller, it would be driven across to impact with the extensional failure regime over here. So suddenly we find there's not a problem. We've got the right stress regime to get vertical extensional fractures in the upper part of the crust during burial. And with the help of fluid pressure, we can generate those fractures. So we've got a set of fractures, their orientation determined by uh, the orientation of um, the stresses that are operating. No problem. What we want to know then is what other features of that uh, fracture set can we discuss and observe and understand? And particularly, we're interested in the regularity of fractures. In other words, how straight they are or how unstraight they are, how irregular they are. And we're also interested in whether or not the fractures are uniformly spaced or whether they cluster together. So when we've got a stress field, we can predict, right, there's gonna be a fracture set in this direction of extensional fractures. They're going to be oriented like this. What we can now do is to explore, is there anything we can say about the regularity of those fractures, both in the plan and profile section and in their spacing? And there is, of course. I've drawn here <clears throat> four more circles, one, two, three, and four. Four is a point, and that's simply representing a state of hydrostatic stress when all the stresses are equal. So when Sigma one, two, and three are the same as they are in a hydrostatic state of stress, the Mohr circle collapses to a point. But these represent four states of stress, all of them with a differential stress, that is the diameter of the Mohr circle, smaller than 4T. They can all generate extensional failure. And one might argue, are they going to produce the same fractures or not? And you can see very clearly from the little sketches at the side that the largest uh, Mohr circle with the largest differential stress, here we've got sigma one, which is compressive, here's sigma three, which is extensional. You can see there's a very clear direction of easy opening in that rock. It's much easier to open fractures against sigma three than it is against sigma one. And consequently, all the fractures form beautifully aligned and form a really nice regular set of fractures. If we go to the other extreme over here and look at this point, which represents hydrostatic stress, then clearly there's no preferred direction of fracture formation. And the result is the, uh, the formation of polygonal fractures as shown here. And of course, as you drift from this fairly marked differential stress, through these less marked differential stresses to this point where there's none, so the regularity of the fractures decrease progressively in this way. And so when we look in nature and see these very straight, regular, nicely spaced fractures here, we know that these are related to a significant differential stress, although less than 4T, because if it was greater than 4T, these would be shear fractures. And as that differential stress gets lower, so the fractures become progressively less and less regular. And you can see what happens in this extreme example. This is the formation of an implosion breccia where the whole thing was generated by a high fluid pressure. So we've got this gradual decrease in differential stress expressing itself in a decrease in regularity of those fractures. So again, we can glance at a fracture set and say, something about the magnitude of the differential stress needed to generate it. Now, we've been looking at the vertical face. This is a vertical face, and you remember, we've got an overburden, which is sigma one, and we've got a horizontal stress, which is sigma three. 
So to this, this argument here has been what generates or what controls the regularity of these fractures in the vertical face. And that clearly is going to be the difference between sigma one and sigma three. We also, of course, could examine the regularity of the fractures in the plane of the bedding, which is the horizontal plane, but that would be the sigma two, sigma three plane. And so the difference between sigma two and sigma three, that differential stress is what controls the regularity of the fractures along strike. And you can see because of this three dimensional outcrop that in this example, that regularity is very profound and impressive. There could be examples when the difference between sigma two and sigma three was small, that these were much more irregular. So by just by glancing at the regularity of these fracture sets, we can get a, a deep insight into the details of the stresses that generated them. So that talks about the regularity of fractures. What about their spacing? What determines whether the fractures form beautiful arrays of extensional fractures like this, or whether the fractures cluster, as you can see they have done in these two examples from limestones in, uh, in, in southwest France near Montpellier, you can see a cluster, a corridor of fractures here and here. So it's interesting, we need to understand when we look at a fracture set, is it going to be of this type here, or are those fractures going to tend to cluster? This is a first order importance if you're interested in the movement of fluids through rocks, whether you're a hydrologist or a, or a hydrocarbon geologist. So people are very, very interested in the parameters that determine whether the fractures cluster into these corridors or fracture corridors, or whether they're nicely spaced. And although it's not really understood, some very interesting numerical model work was done on this uh, way back in the uh, 2004 by Olson and Pollard and his, his group in, 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 in uh, California. And what they did, just let's consider these two experiments here. What we're looking at here is a plan view of a slab of material. It's a numerical model, a slab of material seeded with a large number of small uh, east-west trending uh, fractures. And these two have got exactly the same geometry. The only thing that's different is one of their intrinsic properties. And by exploring and changing different parameters, uh, these workers were able to find the parameter that seemed to control this process of fracture, cl fracture clustering. And it turns out to be related to the magnitude of the stress intensity factor that occurs at a fracture tip in a rock. And that's an intrinsic property of the rock. And this number N down here shows N is 20, which is a relatively low value of stress intensity factor in this material compared to a high value in this material. Now, both materials were ex extended uh, north-south at, at a regular strain rate, and some of these uh, fra seed fractures developed into larger fractures. And you can see when the intensity fracture, the stress intensity fracture was low, what was generated was a beautiful regular system, fairly regularly spaced system of fractures. In contrast, you can see when the stress intensity factor of the rock is high, then instead of forming this beautiful array of well-spaced fractures, the fractures tend to form in a series of clusters. So although the deep mechanics of this is not understood, it's good enough to know that it's the intrinsic property, one of the intrinsic properties of the rock, which determines whether we get fracture corridors forming, or whether we get these regular array of fractures like this. So let's look at a, a fracture uh, network made up of two orthogonal um, fracture sets here. Very simple fracture network made up of two orthogonal sets. Let's separate the fractures out into B and C. B is the early set of fractures and C is the later set. I'll explain how you can tell that in a few seconds time uh, for those of you who don't remember. But basically you can see there's a fundamental difference between these two fracture sets. One of the most important features being the, the regularity of the fractures. You can see the first set of fractures is relatively irregular compared to the much straighter fractures in the second set. So we can see at a glance that the stress regime in the horizontal plane here was relatively low differential stress, whereas here it was a much higher differential stress. 
during the formation of these fractures. So we're getting a, an in indication of a little bit of information about the, not only the orientation of the fractures, but the magnitude of that differential stress. But in addition, notice this, the second set is clustered, whereas the earlier set is not. It's the same rock unit. So what we're doing is we're actually being able to detect a change in properties of the rock through geological time as a result of compaction, cementation, and diagenesis. So we can use the fractures to track changes in both the stress regime and in the rock properties. This is quite remarkable. We can just look at a set of fractures uh, through geological time and actually track the change in mechanical properties of the rocks through time, as well as the tracking the uh, orientation of the tectonic stresses that impacted the, the rocks. So let's, let's summarize where we've got to then. So we can see then this, the simplest possible stress regime, the overburden, uh, can generate a complex stress field. And therefore, if we've got a series of rocks, one, two, three, and four, at some depth in the crust, as I mentioned before, they're all subject to the same overburden. They've got different horizontal stresses. Um, we now have to argue, well, if we can get a fluid pressure, that can push those circles in that direction, there's the potential for fracturing to occur. Now, whether that fluid pressure builds up sufficiently to allow fracturing to occur depends on the properties of the rock, particularly its permeability. So if you've got a rock here, rock two, you can see is highly permeable and the, the fluid pressure that builds up in it is not sufficient to push the Moore circle to the failure envelope. And so rock two has no fractures in it. Whereas rock one has got a large differential stress, and if the fluid pressure in that was sufficient to push it to the failure envelope, it would cause shear fractures. So we get shear fractures in layer one. Going down here, we've got two other uh, more circles. We've got this larger one where we've got a significant difference between sigma one and sigma three. We know that will produce extensional failure, and we also know it will produce a regular array of extensional fractures. Hasn't been time to talk about it today, but many of you will know that there's a fundamental link between the thickness of a layer and the spacing of the fractures. So in this thinner layer of rock type three, I've drawn the fractures closer together than in this thicker layer. And then finally, we've got this last, uh, last uh, more circle with a very low differential stress, not surprisingly, if that gets pushed across to cause failure, the regularity of those fractures is going to be very weak. So what we see here is that just the simplest possible stress regime and overburden, one deformation, causes a complex array of fracture sets to develop at any particular depth in the crust. We know that rocks are generally subject to multiple stress fields and therefore we'd anticipate a rather complex uh, fracture network resulting. So in other words, a simple stress regime produces a complex array of fractures. We're superimposing several stress regimes. We'd anticipate the networks would be very complex. So <clears throat> what we'd like to do now is understand the detailed geometry of these fracture networks. And the way we do that is, is through the process of fracture analysis, which I don't need to go through with you uh, tonight. I can show you a couple of slides that will summarize it, but for those interested in a book that John Hudson and I wrote a few years ago, it's, 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 it's spelt out in there. The basic idea is that we, we know that the type, orientation, and regularity of fractures is intimately controlled by the stress fields. So if we want to know what the fractures are going to do when they're growing within a fractured rock mass, we have to know what the stress field is inside that fractured rock mass. And we can get a, a handle on that by looking at the next slide. So here we've got an open fracture and it's got free surfaces defining the fracture walls. Now those free surfaces can't support a shear stress and therefore, regardless of the orientation of the stress within the bulk of the uh, material, as the stress trajectories approach these free surfaces, they have to orient themselves so that there is no shear stress along those boundaries. So they have to become either normal or parallel to the layer boundary. And as a consequence, they have to rotate. 
And because the fracturing is totally controlled by the stress, so the fractures themselves will rotate, as you can see. And if that is open, if it is a free surface, they should intersect those early fractures at right angles. Now you can see a nice example here where we've got an east-west fracture here, and we've got a diagonal fracture coming down, and you can see it changed its orientation exactly in the same way that this is done as it approaches this fracture here. And that tells us during the time when these fractures were forming, this must have been an open fracture, unable to support a shear stress because that is at 90 degrees there. Similarly, if we look at the north-south fractures, you can see again as this diagonal fracture approaches it, it changes its orientation, hooks into that, and abuts against it. So this is very useful. These two features, the curving of a fracture into an early fracture and the abutting of a fracture against an early fracture tells you their relative age. So we can glance at this slide and say, right, this was an early fracture, and this was a later fracture than this fracture. This was also later than this north-south fracture, but this north-south fracture ends against this fracture. So this was the earliest fracture, this was the next, and this was the third. So it's just using the simple technique of curving and abutting, we can work out the chronology of the fracture sets that are involved in the buildup of a fracture network. And as you'll see in a few minutes time, the order of superposition of these different fracture sets plays a key role in determining the geometry of the fracture network. And it's that geometry we need to find out because it's that which controls the bulk properties. And just, just I can't resist showing you these, this lovely example here. You can see these polygonal fractures forming. And you can see when the fractures form inside one of these polygons, whenever the fractures drift towards a free surface, they swing into an orientation at right angles to that surface. Look at that. Look at this one here. It's going into the material, and then suddenly it decides to swing around, and had desiccation occurred a bit more, it would have swung around and hit the surface at right angles. So it's a very, very strong effect the, these free surfaces have on the stress, and that's picked up by this curving relationship, which is key to determining their chronology. So using that idea, I've simply shown you, uh, show, shown here, three particular fracture sets. This one here, fracture set A, fracture set B, and fracture set C. And you can see, because I have put them abutting here and here, C is clearly later than A and B. And you can see that B abuts against A, and so it's obviously later than A, and A abuts against nothing, so it is the first fracture. So we can now draw those fractures in space with the early fractures A in this orientation, B in this orientation, and C in that orientation. And clipping on the principal stress link to the formation of these extensional fractures, you can see what happens as we move through time from early to late. You can see there's a gradual anti-clockwise rotation of the regional stress field. So these are the sorts of things that geologists are interested in. This is why they're exploring this. But of course, they're, they're not particularly interesting to engineering geologists, but some of the spin-offs, I hope you'll agree later on, really are relevant. So we've established that young fractures tend to curve towards and abut against older fractures. And we know that fractures in a particular fracture set are usually regularly spaced. If they don't cluster, they're more commonly regularly spaced. So these are features we know. And therefore, given the number, the length, and orientation of fractures of two fracture sets, X and Y, and their abutting relationships, we can realistically reproduce the geometry of the fracture network with these data. So let me repeat what I'm trying to say here. I'm saying, Somebody's been into the field, they've collected data, which gives us the number, length, and orientation of the fractures in two fracture sets. And it tells you their relative age because it gives you their abutting relationship. If they give you that data, you can draw the, early, the long early fractures. You can draw the later fractures abutting against them. And this is the sort of thing you might generate. So here you can see we're given the information. We've got these long, sub-horizontal fractures, so east-west fractures, shorter north-south fractures, and we will put them together into a geologically realistic uh, 
geometry like that. If, and of course this wouldn't happen, I don't think, but if, for example, those data were imported into a numerical model, these are the data we've obtained from the field, let's import them into a numerical model to try and mimic the fractured rock mass and distribute them stochastically, you can see it would be a disaster because there's absolutely no correspondence between this material here and this material here in terms of its geomechanical properties. You can see there's the same number of fractures in both, there's the same sets, the same density, the same mean length, but the connectivity is massive here and hardly at all here, the backbone again, and the flow of fluids through this system, totally different. So if we don't understand these few basic principles of what controls the way in which fracture sets interact with each other as they're superimposed, we've got very little chance of generating a good feel, a good understanding of the internal geometry of much more complex fracture networks. And just to show you uh, the importance I mentioned before, the importance of getting the chronology of fractures development, fracture set development in a rock in the right order, you can see if we have these two fracture sets, if the first fracture set, or the, if the horizontal fracture set is the first and the second is vertical, you can see that's the pattern that develops. And if we reverse that order, then this is the fracture we get. So we've got two, identical stress fields, but if we reverse the order in which they're superimposed on the rock, you can see the geometry of the fracture network is very, very different. And this is just a, a very simple example to illustrate the idea, but you can imagine um, the order of succession is critical in determining the network geometry. If, say, we've got five fracture sets in the study area and measuring, and, and we measure their orientation and spacing, this is not sufficient to determine the geometry of the resulting network. We know the fracture set, we know its orientation, we know its spacing. If we've got five sets and we don't know the order in which they were superimposed, we are not gonna generate the correct geometry of fracture network. So how do we develop, understand and develop and, and, and gather the information about the bulk mechanical properties and the internal geometry of these fracture networks. Well, there are two ways of doing this, uh, and I'm going, to, I'm going to illustrate these two ways by the field example I'm going to discuss in a few minutes, but we can do a theoretical study. That might sound strange. You've got a particular rock site, a site you're going to build something on or dig something out of, and you want to understand what the fracture network is going to look like. If you know the tectonic history of the region, then you know the major tectonic events that have hit that rock, you know its orientation, you know their orientations, you can predict what fractures might develop in response to those tectonic events and the order in which they occur. So we can do that study and we can predict the geometry of the fracture network. We can then go into the field and actually measure and record what the network looks like and compare the two to see how valid this purported uh, theoretical study is in generating the geometry of the fracture network. So both, if possible, of course, if you can't get into the field, all you can do is that. But if you can get into the field, it's really useful to think about this study to see how the two relate to, to pick up any problems you might have. So I'm going to use both these approaches to look at the um, fracture networks that develop in the Codermian granites of, of um, of the Channel Islands of Jersey here, okay? So we're gonna look at both. And the first thing I'm gonna do is look at a theoretical study of what, on the basis of what we understand in the tectonic evolution of this region, would we expect to find in the granites in terms of a fracture network? So here we go. So here is the area, here's Jersey. And the reason these are the granites that were studied and <clears throat> There are three major processes that are likely to generate fractures. The process of burial, the process of tectonism, and there may be several regional tectonic events, and the process of exhumation. So we know the rocks were buried, they were they're granites, they were intruded at depths in the late Precambrian, they've been tectonized by several events, and they've been exhumed. And all those processes will generate fractures. Now we know the tectonism 
is the result of the Cadomian orogeny, which occurred in the late Precambrian, when these granite masses were intruded into the lower part of the crust. There's the, the late Carboniferous Variscan orogeny. There's the Mesozoic extension linked to the breakup of Pangaea. And there's the Alpine orogeny linked to the collision of the African and European plates. These are the four major tectonic events that have affected these Cadomian granites. Now, because of all the structures that are related to these events here, we know precisely the orientation of the stress fields. Uh, and, and, and we also have to remember these simple diagrams here, which show the situations when sigma one is vertical, sigma two is vertical, and sigma three is vertical. Now, there are reasons why the stresses are either horizontal or vertical. One of them is, of course, the Earth's surface is a free surface, and so the trajectories have to be right at the surface, have to be at right angles or parallel to the Earth's surface. But more importantly, of course, the two processes of stressing in the crust, the two dominant processes, are those of overburden stress, which produces a vertical sigma one, and horizontal stresses linked to uh, plate tectonics, which produce horizontal stresses. So the processes of stress generation in the upper crust and the free surface at the upper crust mean that generally you can argue that we've got the one of the principal stresses vertical and the other two horizontal near the Earth's surface and obviously deeper down as well. So when sigma one is vertical, we get normal faulting. When sigma two is vertical, we get wrench faulting. And when sigma three is vertical, we get thrust faulting. And dotted onto these diagrams are the extensional fractures would form in the stress regime if the differential stress was low. So the dotted lines are the stress regimes linked to uh, the, these events if the differential stress is low. So having said that, we can look at those events here. We've got the Alpine, the Mesozoic extension, the Hercynian orogeny, and the Cadomian orogeny with their individual colors. We know from the study of the, of the structures linked to those events that there was a northwest-southeast compression for this, east-west extension for that, north-south compression for that, and northeast-southwest compression for that. So we can work out what the shear fractures and extensional fractures would be if those stress fields generated the fractures. Now, what's interesting is that when you look at the granites in, in the field in, in Jersey, they're dominated on the scale we're looking at by extensional fractures. So we've ignored the shear fractures. We've just predicted the extensional fractures that could form in response to these three major tectonic events and drawn them all with equal importance through this block here. So this then is the block that shows all of the four extensional fractures linked to those four events. But the problem is, of course, it hasn't taken account of the chronology, which we're totally aware of. So we can do that. We can argue that the early fractures will be fine. There'll be the long Cadomian fractures here. They are going straight through the material. But as we get progressively younger and younger, so these later extensional fractures are progressively inhibited by pre-existing fractures and become shorter and shorter. And if you apply that argument to this rock mass here, we generate a much more realistic looking rock mass, which is the rock mass here. So what you can see here is the rock mass, the fractured rock mass that we predict will occur in these granites if we were to go into the field to look at them. We, don't, we haven't been into the field, we may not be able to get there in some, in some areas, we may not be able to have access to it, but we can predict what the likely fractured rock mass will look like, and that's what we've done here. Now, the thing to do now, of course, is to go into the field and look at the fractures and see if we get a correspondence between this theoretically predicted fractured rock mass and the fractured rock mass that actually develops. And luckily, the work's been done by one of my students, uh, Miles Cover, when he was working on a, an MSI project uh, looking at these fractured rock masses a few years ago. Uh, and he went out and he, he looked at all the granite outcrops around here, these Codomium granites, did all the mapping of the, of the fractures, boiled that down and identified 12 main fracture sets, all extensional fracture sets, okay? So these were the main fracture sets that he got. 
listed as one to 12 here. And given the different dip direction, you get the orientation of the fractures, the number of fractures, the variance and things like this. And that's fine. So the argument is these are the fractures actually observed in the rock. Let's stick these fractures onto a block and see what comes out. But the first thing that Miles did was to simply draw a single fracture representing each of those fracture sets and passing it through the central point of that cube. And that generates this fracture block here. Slightly more realistically, he allowed himself a couple of fractures, didn't insist on them passing through the center of the cube, and this was the fracture drop mass that he got. And that was fine, but then, of course, having established the chronology, and if I just go back, if I can, yeah, what Miles did, of course, was to look at the fractures in the field and establish the chronology of those fractures, and he could then apply this known chronology. This, these are the order in which the fractures were formed, 1 to 12, and that order is based on the cross-cutting relationships or the abutting relationships of these various fractures. So having done that, we transform the model from this, in which all the fracture sets are given full through-going properties to this more realistic model where the early fractures are through-going, but the later fractures are progressively more and more inhibited in propagation. And that was fine, but by looking in the field, we found that there were fracture corridors here, here, and here. And so, again, it was possible to modify that um, <clears throat> model by introducing these fracture corridors into that model. Let's go through again. Okay. And so here you can see that the north-south fracture sets have been replaced by these little fracture corridors, and the east-west trending fracture sets have been, re uh, have been replaced by these fracture corridors. In addition, there are many um, fractures, horizontal fractures in these granites. And if we look at the prediction of the, uh, pr uh, the predicted fractures that would form in response to the various stress fields, several of the stress fields, one in particular, would give rise to horizontal extensional fractures. And what we suspected is that these horizontal fractures here, which were tectonically induced originally, when the whole area was being exhumed, um, we got exhumation fractures, which, as you probably know, develop as large sheet fractures, and they probably exploited these pre existing fractures here. So, what we've got here is a fractured rock mass measured in the field. We've got the individual frac set, fracture sets. We've got some of them as fracture corridors, some of them as clean fractures. What, what we haven't done here is we haven't put on the chronology, we haven't given which is, which is the first, second, and third. That will be the next stage. But having done that, you can see we just let this fracture rock mass collapse under gravity, losing blocks. And you can see that these negative features and positive features in the field are fairly good correspondence with this general model here. So the detailed modeling of the fracture network by field observation not surprisingly gives a good correspondence to the fractures that form. These caves, by the way, are the famous caves in, in South uh, Jersey, where um, early man, remains of early man have been found, so they're re remarkably well known, but it's nice to see that they're formed in these retreating uh, Cadomian cliffs, uh, controlled their geometry by, of course, the fracture network within the rock. So there's a nice correspondence between the fractures that form in the rock and the uh, structures, the negative and posit positive structures that form. There's also an encouraging correspondence between this fractured rock mass, which we generate from field data, and the fractured rock mass we predicted from the tectonic evolution of the region. Now, there's still a long way to go here. The fracture sets are fine, but how can I say? We haven't 
got a handle on the individual properties of the fractures. So what I would suggest here is we've got to a certain point in the study of these fracture networks, we've obeyed the rules of abutting, we've, we've used those to constrain and refine the three-dimensional geometry of this fracture network. What we haven't been able to do is to think about the properties of the individual fractures. Now, starting off again, let's, let's say we've got that fracture network, we can, we can import that fracture network into a, a numerical model, there's no problem with that, um, and it can be analyzed, we would have to give those fractures a property. Now, the obvious thing to do is to put a property such as a, a low cohesion on them all, which is uniform for them all. Not realistic, but it's a good first step. So we're saying, right, we've got the fracture network here sorted out, the geometry is intact, we'll give all those fractures a low cohesive strength, and then we can load the model and look at the impact that fracture network has on the bulk properties of strength and transmissivity, conductivity. What would be the next stage, of course, would be to go into the field and look in detail at the fractures themselves to see if we can get a handle on their properties. And a lot of people have been working on this, it's outside my field, but I know uh, John Harrison has been very interested in working on the uh, properties of individual fractures, particularly concerned about regularity. And on a small scale, that relates to the, um, <coughs> to the, to the um, roughness of the fractures. So clearly, if we look in detail at this three-dimensional fracture network, the next step to improve its veracity is to try to quantify what the properties of the individual fractures are, particularly their cohesion and their permeability. For example, it's very difficult to know about the continuity of fracture. Some fractures are clean going through, some are slightly uh, cemented in areas, some are naturally have low, con uh, low continuity, they are but, uh, and others are very, very irregular. So we can't impose or argue that the properties of every fracture is the same. What we've done so far is to generate the fracture network, which has got the correct geometry, and the next, the next task is to import realistic values of the um, fractures into that model, and that'll move it forward. So, so that's where we are at the moment, and I'm afraid that's a very short lecture, but that's where I'm at, and that's where we are. So I'm thinking to myself, where do we go from here? How can we possibly develop this further? We've got a really good feeling for what controls the buildup of fracture networks. Now what we need to understand is what, what the properties, how can we quantify the properties of those individual fracture sets so that we can upgrade even further the numerical models, which can then be used, hopefully, to predict the bulk properties of these materials. It's a real problem. You, uh, you're all familiar with the fact that we've got the intrinsic property of the uh, intact rock, and these intrinsic properties are important, but they often bear very little uh, relationship to the bulk properties, which are the properties the rock mass has when we consider a large volume of it with many, many fractures cutting through it. So short lecture, I'm sorry about that. I've rattled through it very quickly, but I hope it was interesting and I'm happy to take any questions you might have on that. Sorry, I'm just going to jump in. Uh, thank you very much, Sean. That was fascinating. Um, for anyone in the audience, if they've got a question, I'm going to run around for mic. And if not, in the meantime, I'm going to grab my phone to find out any questions from the Zoom call. So, for anyone who's got a question, please say your name and your company, and then your question. Is this on? Yeah. Okay. Hi, I'm uh, Dave Vizzle. I used to be a student of yours here many years ago. <laughs> Too long to remember. Mm -hmm. um, both properties of rock masses are very much related to the scale of, uh, of the bulk that you're looking at. 
Absolutely. Are you going to be taking that into account? Yes. I mean that that's that's a really good point. Let's see if we can. Uh, well, I mean this is this is. Let me just go here. We we can see here that this rock. And I'm afraid that the point is not working, but you can see this rock mass here has got fractures in it, and and and. I would argue that when you've got that number of fractures in that rock mass, uh, we can argue that the fracture network will probably dominate the bulk properties. Your question is, as we go smaller and smaller, when do we flip over and the intrinsic properties become important? That clearly has to be, that clearly has to be specific to specific sites. Uh, uh, but I would argue that generally fracture spacing um, is, is something like we can see on these bottom diagrams here. So if you're including as many fractures as are drawn on that block diagram, uh, that would be more than sufficient to say you're moving over to bulk properties rather than intrinsic properties of the rock. Uh, but it's a very interesting question. If we want, what would be terribly interesting, I think, if we could trust the numerical modeling of this block here, we could gradually reduce the size of that block and test the properties uh, each time we reduce it and see when that begins to drift away from a regular bulk property towards an intrinsic property. It would be an interesting exercise to do. Uh, what, what it would mean, I don't know, because I think before we could really answer that question, how big has the block got to be before we can abandon intrinsic properties and bank on, on, on um, uh, bulk properties, it, it must be different for different rocks. But it's a jolly good question. I think it could be explored numerically with that technique. Okay. I think many years ago, uh, Everett Cook gave uh, a ranking lecture uh, Imperial, and uh, he he hinted on this problem because he was looking at very very large uh, excavations. I think it was in China, and he was comparing the bulk properties of that excavation with what you get in a tunnel, say, which is a, a exactly. completely different scale. Exactly. And he was worrying about where that exactly that trunk, and, and he hadn't uh, he yes. said that this is a future thing to look at. It is a future thing to look at still. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but it clearly is, it, each case will be different. You need to look at the fracture yeah. spacing and use a bit of intuition on that. But clearly, that transition from one to the other will be a very interesting thing to study. And I would have thought a numerical modeling approach would be helpful just to see what happens. Do we get a sudden <laughs> jump or is it a gradual change from bulk to intrinsic properties that way? Well, of course, in the, uh, that was a long time ago and, and numerical modeling was- Yeah, of course. And, yeah. Uh, I think now there's a obvious PhD beckoning now. Oh, I'm, I'm sure there is. <laughs> Not for me, I'm afraid. <laughs> no, no, I'm sure there is. But again, you see, it, it's the same old problem we had when people used to populate um, uh, models, numerical models, stochastically with fractures, yeah. trying to start that off. We would suddenly begin to read, oh, better not do that. It's not a good idea. It doesn't reflect uh, what fractures really do to the rock. I think we've got a handle on that now, but we still haven't got an understanding or we can't yet input the properties of those individual fracture sets into the model. And that would be important if we were numerically modeling. But as a trier, it would be nice to give them all the same strength, those fractures, and then just reduce the size and see if we can get the switch over, whether it's a rapid ramp or whether it just is a slow change from one to the other. It's a critical problem, it really is. <clears throat> I'm just going to try the other one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh okay. Um, Jasper Cook. Um, I, I don't work for anybody. <laughs> um, I'm interested in the modeling you might have on the fracture corridors. Because that re those are really the, some of the key things that we're interested in as in geologists, and how can you predict which fractures will become corridor and which will not? I know it's it'll be related to intrinsic properties, uh, bedding, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but how is the modeling on that one? Because that would be very important for us 
Yeah, that, there are two very interesting aspects to that question. Uh, one is um, what causes the clustering, which we've talked, talked a little bit about. But the next thing is that what happens within those clusters? Because you've got the close proximity of these major fractures, then cross-linking occurs a lot. So in other words, because of their proximity, the permeability, the, the, the density of fractures within them increases naturally. And so not only have you got a whole variety of vertical or, or fractures that are allowing transmission, the, 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 the damage between them also facilitates. So they really are highways. Now you're wanting me to quantify, it's really difficult, you can't do that. Uh, but what, I wonder if this is still working, I think I flick back to the, yeah, these corridors. I'd rather go back to look at these, just bear with me. I'll find it. The fracture, these. <clears throat> you can see, when you look at the, this one here, you can see discrete fractures within this fracture corridor. But in this one here, it's much more deformed. The, the, the microlisms between the fractures are much more fractured. So I'm not sure what controls that. But I just know that the proximity of these fractures means that the breakup of the sl slivers of rock between them is much more likely. So as well as having the fractures themselves, you've got a zone of fracturing, which facilitates fluid migration. Not really answering your question, I'm just simply yeah. saying, <laughs> yeah. it, it, I'm saying what we understand about them at the moment. Jean Petit, Jean, Jean Pierre Petit has been working on these fracture corridors for a long time. And again, although we're not sure about how they form, we know how important they are to controlling fluid migration in the crust. And yeah, they, yeah. they feed on, they, they feed on themselves and become, Worse and worse in our in our, in our. They, cer they certainly can do in limestones. I mean, sometimes it can get clogged by precipitation, but often uh, groundwater flowing through those is acidic and it, it accelerates the solution and, and the whole thing becomes progressively more and more. So you're absolutely right. It's saying it's no good knowing what the individual, what the permeability of the rock is. If you've got a couple of these fracture corridors, forget that, that's going to control everything. And this is our dilemma knowing when the intrinsic properties are important and when these one-off fracture corridors become dominant. But I'm not answering your question. I, I don't know the answer to it. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the lecture. Uh, my name is Maria Ferentino. I'm from Liverpool John Moores University. Uh, mostly I would like a comment. Uh, you said previously about the persistence, for example, that it's difficult to incorporate in your models. So I would like a comment from you about these stochastic networks, the DFN models like Frackman, that produce all these synthetic rock masses that they're uh, use it, used a lot in mining, but they, they, they... How your approach could be integrated, yeah, could make numerical models better. Yes, <clears throat> I think, <clears throat> I think the answer to that question is that clearly the stochastical throwing in of fractures is, is not appropriate. And by understanding the way in which the fracture networks in the rock are built up over geological time, it becomes clear that that's a totally inappropriate way to do it. So in other words, if you've got numerical modeling being carried out by experts who aren't earth scientists or aren't being guided by earth scientists, gross mistakes can be made. There's nothing wrong with stochastic putting those fractures in, but the properties we're interested in relate specifically to the geometry of the fracture networks, which that completely obliterates. So of course, I, I, I really can't say what you should do. I'm just saying, don't stochastically populate your models with fractures, be guided by the principles and, and, and things we've seen in this lecture, which tell you precisely how the fractures react with each other. And that constrains the organization of the fractures within the network. So I, I really can't, I'm not a numerical modeler, but I know that numerical models have been done, which are brilliant, except they started off on the wrong premise. They put in the fractures in the wrong orientation. That's all I can say. So really we need 
numerical models, for sure we do. And it's, as you were saying, we've got fantastic ability to do things with numerical models now. They're really very impressive. But the old adage, rubbish in, rubbish out, still applies. And if we don't get the models right in terms of their geometry and their properties, we're going to struggle. That's the point. Sorry I didn't answer it more fully. That's the best I can do. Thank you. I've got a question, Tom Morgan from GCG. Um, we've, when we tend to create our conceptual ground models as engineering geologists, we tend to focus more on the sort of, even though it's meant to constrain the whole geological history of a site, I think we tend to focus a lot more on, say, the depositional history that's and recent history of the site that's affected it. But I think what you're from from your talk, John, you're really saying as well that we should also be thinking about the stress history more carefully as well. So, um, what tools would you advise for engineering geologists, to, or ways of thinking would you advise for engineering geologists to help us with our conceptualizing of a site ready for grand engineering? If I could answer that, I wouldn't be here. I've been making money. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> I think no, no, no quick answer to that, Tom. But I think. The more people are aware of this, the less likely they are to remain blinkered in temporally and spatially when considering their, their engineering sites. So really, <clears throat> it's a question of just being aware of this uh, that will prevent you from making errors that lead to the, 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 the misprediction of, of, of fracture sets I, or, or, or properties. I can't be more specific than that. It's not easy. But it's no good just looking at the rock and thinking about the present stress regime and what's happening. You really need to know the background. You need to know the evolution of the fracture system. Otherwise, you're you're batting a, a very difficult wicket. Sorry, I can't answer it. No, no, that. that's fine. It just makes you think of, say, London with the work. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yes. <laughs> Don't build anywhere in London. It's too unstable and too unpredictable. Okay. I think there's no more questions, Mark. Okay, well, John, thank you very much for your talk. Um, that was absolutely fascinating. And um, I think we should all just close off with a round of applause. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you all for turning out. It's really marvelous when it would have been so much easier to stay at home and just switch the television on and watch it there. So I'm really grateful that you came up. It's lovely to have a live audience to talk to as well. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, John. And for those who are here, we're um, planning to go to the pub around the corner so against the goat tavern so which is just off old bond street so please come along if you fancy a pint yes Thank <laughs> you. 